Hey friends, thanks for watching today's video. I'm going to be talking about my top five likes and dislikes on the X-T225. I'll also throw in what I think are some compromises with the bike, some things that are both good and bad. Uh, overall, you know, I love the motorcycle. And so I'm sure that'll come through today. Uh, so let's see what we have in store. I appreciate you joining me for the ride. My goal is to try and give you some good information here, some explanation, uh, without rambling on too, too long. So, getting straight to the likes and counting them down. Starting with number five, I like the economical nature of this bike. Uh, it gets 70 miles to a gallon pretty darn consistently, sometimes even more. Uh, it's because it's a lower powered motorcycle, it's relatively easy on chains, sprockets, tires, oil, those kinds of consumables. Uh, higher revving, higher powered bikes. Just use that stuff up faster. I might go an entire season with only adjusting the chain maybe three times. And tires definitely last a riding season. Well, actually I'll take that back. I'm probably getting 3,000 plus on a rear, and I'll do more than that this year, uh, and say 6,000 plus on the front. So, the economy of owning the bike. Uh, you know, when it comes to the actual purchase price of an XT225 right now, I couldn't tell you because at the moment it's just crazyville with used bike prices. Dealers are having a terribly hard time getting new motorcycles in stock. The used market has gone insane no matter what you're looking to buy, so I don't know. In a year or so, it'll settle down. We'll see where we are. Number four on my like list is the torque of the motorcycle, and that's the pulling power of the bike. And for a low CC bike, I think it's technically 223 cc's. It has great pulling power starting at not far over 3,000 RPMs. It feels like from, say, 3,000 to above 6,000, it's got great pulling power and a very flat torque curve. And if I listen to some of my videos, I'm kind of surprised sometimes at how I'm lugging the engine, how low I'm riding in the torque curve on the bike. Why do I like that torque curve? Well, it makes it easy to ride. The bike doesn't do anything surprising when you get on the throttle. That makes it great for beginners. But for a seasoned rider, it allows me to lug the bike. And the advantage to that is that if I'm making near maximum torque at say 4,000 RPM, I have good pulling power for the trails, but I'm not turning a bunch of RPM, so I'm not spinning on really like high performance motorcycles they often make their peak power up at high revs uh, it's more tiring to ride it takes more technique to ride and also you're just going to risk spinning the tire that's you know i grew up on old two-stroke motocross bikes where you had to rev the heck out of them and boy were they a blast to ride they were a ton of fun i still like it but you didn't have that down low lugging power and you had to work a whole lot harder on the trail. So for a small displacement bike, I think the XT225 really shines in that department. Number three, uh, we've talked about it on this channel a lot, the six speed transmission. And just having a six speed transmission isn't in and of itself magical on a motorcycle. I think it matters more on the smaller bikes because what it allows you to do is with an extra gear in there, say over a, a five speed, you can space the transmission ratios closer together. There's a smaller gap between them, so it takes better advantage of the bike's pulling power. 
another thing about having that extra gear is that you can uh, Yamaha can gear the bike really low in first gear for the trails and then with uh, the sixth gear it's geared relatively high for the road they've matched it well to the pulling power of the bike um, I've talked about it on here before I believe the stock front sprocket was a 15 tooth and I went down to a 14 tooth and I like that overall gearing a little bit better how's it going Hey, right on. So, I love the gearing how it is. And with those close transmission ratios, the gap from first to second gear on a six-speed can be smaller. Now, that's advantageous on the small bike because I can be in first gear on a trail and then if I need a little more speed, I can click up to second and it isn't a huge jump. With fewer gears, it would be a little bit larger jump. It's, it's a shame when you get a bike, and I've had them, if you don't have the overall gearing dialed in, it can sometimes, you can find that first gear is too low for a situation you want to be in, but second gear is just a little bit too high. And uh, I think Yamaha just really did a great job with this particular transmission. Then number two on the like list is the weight of the bike. Uh, it weighs 238 pounds dry, so I'm going to say with gas and oil, we're probably looking at an extra 20 pounds. So we'll say 258, we'll say 260 with fluids and ready to ride. And 260 is pretty remarkable in this budget dual sport category, I think. Um, closest bike is probably the newer generation Yamaha, the XT250, that compares really favorably with this. And I believe it's at 290. Uh, the Honda and the Kawasaki, they have features. The, their uh, 300s dual sports have features like uh, water cooling, beefier suspension, a beefier frame. That all adds to the weight. And so they are coming in around 300 to 310 with fluids I think so we're looking at a bike here that's you know somewhere around 50 pounds lighter than the competition I think if you got an exotic KTM of some sort you know you're paying 10 grand even if you get a 500 you're probably heck it's probably as light as this or even lighter but that's a whole different category and a different kind of motorcycle Then, number one, another thing you're well aware of if you've watched any of my other videos, I love the seat height of the bike, 31.9 inches. I'm a short guy. Uh, I read all the time online. People say things like, hey, look, you don't have to flat foot a motorcycle to be able to ride it. I totally agree with that. I'm, I'm 57 years old. I've been riding since I was 11. I've raced, you know, tall motocross bikes. Um, and to be honest, I hate to even admit this, I don't even touch flat foot on this thing. Most of my friends climb on it and they have flat footed, really bent knees, but that's just at 5'5 five five with the 28 inch inseam, that's just the way that it's fitting me. There we go, there's that lugging power going down low with the bike. And it just chugs right along. So the seat height allows me to not only touch the ground on the trails, I tell you, I feel pretty confident on the trails. That's not the biggest thing. The biggest thing for me is on a really tall bike, if I have to stretch, it gets tiring for me on the road on a dual sport. Going from stoplight to stoplight, I do live in the city, and constantly stretching that leg out can just get fatiguing. So that's it. That's my top five likes. It's the economy. It's the torque the six speed, the lightweight, and the low seat height. Now, it's not a perfect motorcycle uh, for me, by my judgment, because I do have dislikes. And if we look at those, the number five dislike for me is highway riding. It's just not built to go on the interstate. I've done it, it can do it. I've done it for an hour or more at a time. But there are a couple of things. 
yeah the bike tops out in speed around well my speedometer with it geared the way it is is telling me 77 miles an hour which to be honest probably with the gps it's around 70 miles an hour so let's say 70. Uh, you can keep up with a lot of traffic but it's not like once you get up to 60 or so like you can accelerate quickly so you don't want to be in heavy traffic on it uh, consistently and it's also uh, the benefit of that light weight makes it not as great for highway riding because the bike can get blown around by big trucks it also is uh, it can have a tendency to wander on rain grooves not terribly but it's just the nature of a lightweight motorcycle take a big old fully dressed Harley it's gonna stick to the ground a little bit better in those situations so it'll do the highway riding but it's not real comfortable with it if that's your focus I wouldn't make this my first choice uh, the number four dislike is that it's a non-current model this is a 2006 model Yamaha imported the XT225 from I believe 1992 to 2007 so they haven't imported a new one since 2007 that's 14 years ago and why I give that a dislike is not because I'm trying to be fashionable uh, like I have to have a current bike that's not it it's uh, not because of features necessarily it's really because I'm starting to realize you know once a motorcycle reaches 20 years old it's really a vintage bike and this will have been out of new circulation uh, for you know 20 years not that many years from now what I've seen recently while motorcycles are having or while motorcycle dealers are having a hard time getting new bikes in they're also having a hard time getting parts in and when you think about it if manufacturers have to make hard choices about what parts to continue making what parts to stock at some point they're gonna start letting go of the older bikes so though there are a bunch of these in circulation when does Yamaha say you know we're not gonna make that uh, we're not gonna make that a cylinder for that bike anymore just because we would rather at this point have you buy a new bike so it's non-current number three on my dislikes is that uh, aftermarket support it's that there's very low aftermarket support for the bike and that does have something to do with it not being a current model uh, take something like the CRF 300L Honda man you can buy all kind of accessories for it all day long at really budget prices just because it's a new bike people are excited about it and they're wanting to buy a new bike and modify it right when they get it the vast majority of xt 225s that are still out there are going to stay just the way they are as long as they're running there's not going to be a lot of aftermarket support uh, if you do want aftermarket stuff, ProCycle is the place to go. I'll put that uh, link here on the screen. They have everything for the bike that you can get pretty much. But when it comes to the engine, you're going to find, if you want to modify it, you can get a different air filter and a different exhaust. Uh, a jetting kit for the carburetor. But it's not like you can go to a tuner and say, I would like a... An, uh, aftermarket uh, power jet carburetor and a cam and valve springs and a matched pipe and porting and polishing if you want to do that stuff you're gonna have to dig through old forums you're gonna have to dig through old parts catalogs you're gonna have to call four different companies try and match stuff up there just isn't that kind of aftermarket support for it uh, one thing I've found I'm a little disappointed in is that uh, the good news is there's a company called Cogent Dynamics that makes fantastic suspension for the bike, but it involves you know $400 fork mod if you do the work yourself, and it involves um, a complete replacement shock, and 
you're well over a thousand dollars if you if you want to really step up the suspension there's no uh no kind of intermediate between low budget and high budget options for that that i've ever seen uh number two the wheels and the brakes wheels slash brakes are my number two dislike and that's because it's really acknowledged that the rear wheel on this bike has uh, spindly spokes soft spokes and it has a soft hub so if the spokes get loose they can stretch they can kind of stretch the holes in the hub you just need to keep an eye on it one of the things that I do that I've read that other people do that seems to be working fine for me is running higher tire pressures over rough terrain with the bike and the upside is that I think that really does keep the rims from taking a beating and causing any problems but it also bounces me around a lot if I'm running street pressure off-road because I think that's going to benefit the longevity of the wheels then that's a compromise between me getting the best kind of traction that I possibly can so for the rear wheel some people will substitute a TTR 225 rear hub it's still a drum brake and I said slash brakes is a dislike the rear has a drum brake uh, so it's not a disc it's not as powerful as the other competition in the class uh, and uh, the front wheel though I haven't heard bad things about it I did manage to crack a hub through fault of my own changing bearings I did not heat the hub up before I tapped out the bearings and I tapped out bearings and I looked and there was a crack in the hub so I had that that, so relaced the wheel putting in a new hub and then one time when I did run low pressure in the tires I managed to crack the very nice front DID rim so cracked rim that's a weak point uh, I think on the XT250 they have discs front and rear and I think both wheels are beefier then my number one dislike for the suspension for the uh, motorcycle and I kind of started to talk about that with the aftermarket stuff is the suspension it's not horrible by any means but something has to rank number one and it's just kind of soft it's older technology damper rod forks up front so they're notoriously unless you spring them really softly which the XT is uh, the damper rod forks can be a little harsh on little bumps and then soft on big bumps. Uh, they just don't have the adjustability of, say, the Kawasaki KLX 250-300. Uh, but, truthfully, not even the CRF 300L has really adjustable suspension. So, uh, the XT225 has budget suspension. As I mentioned in the aftermarket segment, there aren't really budget upgrade paths for it. My foam bumper on my rear shock has deteriorated and is gone. And so the shock needs disassembled to put a new foam bumper on it, but it's non-rebuildable, so it can't be disassembled. Like anything, if you dig deep enough and far enough into the old forums, you can find people who have rebuilt the shock. But, again, it's just like trying to hop the bike up. There aren't a lot of advanced practical solutions to it. And that's why Cogent Dynamics makes that great replacement shock. Uh, it allows you to do all the things you would expect with a good suspension. So those are the top five likes and dislikes. Overall, I still love the motorcycle. Even when I ride with people with newer bikes, at the end of the day, I'm really happy to be on what I'm, what I'm riding. Now, I'd mentioned compromises a little bit ago, and this is where I'd like to impart a little bit of information that I think a lot of people don't think about when they're looking at spec sheets uh, and, and in most discussions. And 
one of those compromises is the frame rails, the frame under the engine. Uh, the fact is, there isn't any frame under the engine. There's just a fairly lightweight stock skid plate. So the engine is, and, and it's the same way on the TW200 and the XT250, the engine is a stressed member, meaning in front of the engine, uh, there's frame hooked to it, and behind the engine, there's frame hooked to it, but there's none underneath. Uh, it works out just fine. The, the, the downside to that is that when it comes to crossing over logs or bashing over rocks or things like that, I'm just not going to press the issue hard on this motorcycle. On another bike with frame rails down there and a heavy duty skid plate, you can just bash over stuff. Where on this one, I'm gonna think twice about it, be easier on it than, than that. Uh, the plus sides on not having the frame rails are, yes, it for the, for the vast majority of riding, it's fine. Yes, it does contribute to the lighter weight of the bike. And it contributes to ground clearance. An amazing thing about this bike is not only does it have a really low seat height for a dual sport, 31.9 inches, it also has 11.2 inches of ground clearance. So, for example, put that up against the brand new 2021 Honda CRF 300L. This bike and that bike both have the same amount of ground clearance, 11.2 inches. But the CRF has more suspension and has a seat height that's about three inches taller. So I'm willing to give up that little bit of travel to be able to touch the ground with the lower seat. And I'm really grateful to have that extra bit of ground clearance. I'm referring to my little notes here. Oh, another thing that I think is a compromise is the swing arm. It's very unusual and it's a wonderful thing that the swing arm uh, pivot points and the uh, suspension pivot points on the rockers all have zerk fittings so that you can grease the suspension at normal maintenance intervals. Lots of bikes don't have that. Uh, and so kudos to Yamaha for including that. I absolutely love that. The downside is that it's really simple, just either nylon bushings at the swing arm pivot or in the suspension pivots, it's a kind of thin metal collar on bushing kind of setup. It is not needle bearings. So they gave us the ability to keep the sus suspension points greased but they cut corners in budget by using bushings. Uh, so I consider that, you know, good and bad. And then the last thing I'll mention about a compromise is the simplicity of the bike. I love the simplicity of the bike. Uh, it's, there's not a whole lot to break you know, it's as simple as a bike gets, and it's super easy to work on, which I love, and I enjoy working on motorcycles. Uh, it makes it lighter. It doesn't have water cooling. It doesn't have heavy suspension components. Uh, so the sim simplicity is a wonderful thing. Uh, the downside is it is that it's not gonna have the super long extended maintenance intervals that a bike with the uh, the water cooling is going to have. Some of these bikes now, you know, they talk about valve checks every 20,000 or 30,000 miles. It's easy to do on this bike, but I'm probably gonna do it every 5,000 miles just to be safe. Uh, so with the simplicity, you get benefits, but you don't get some of the advantages of the new technology. Hey, I have no idea how much time I've been talking. I hope it hasn't been boring. I hope it's been informative more than, hey, I like this because it's really cool kind of thing. Uh, you take all these things together, you wrap them up, and that's what makes a motorcycle unique, and that's what 
makes it appeal or not appeal to different people. If I was taller, I would maybe be on a different bike, but maybe not. Uh, if I was doing a lot of highway miles, I would definitely be on a different bike. But for the way you've seen me ride in this video, and if you've seen any of my other videos, I'm super comfortable with this. Um, speaking of riding videos, I am so happy with my last riding video. We had a lot of fun. We had some drama. Uh, there were, there were um, conquests and there were uh, victories and defeats. And, but it's hard to get eyeballs on those riding videos. People love technical videos much more. Or uh, YouTube seems to reward technical videos much more. So if you get a chance, there's a link up above. Check out that last riding video. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about it. Should I keep making those videos? Because they're a blast to make, but if they're just not going to be seen by people, I don't know if it's worth the effort or not. So help me figure that out. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'll let myself at another place and time talk us out of this video. Have a great day. Hope you can get out and ride. And I hope you've enjoyed the talk and the scenery. See ya. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a like, and I hope you'll consider subscribing for future riding and wrenching videos. Ride safe.